welcome to worship on this Good Friday. Uh, welcome to our service of, of Tenebrae. This is a continuation of yesterday's Monday Thursday service, uh, and it will conclude um, really with our worship on Easter Sunday as we gather to celebrate the resurrection. This is the worship of the great three days, the Triduum, um, from Monday Thursday through Good Friday to Easter Sunday resurrection. Tenebrae is a centuries-old service of the Christian Church. It is sometimes called the service of shadows, characterized by the extinguishing of candles and lights as the story of our Lord's death is related. Tenebrae climaxes with the removal of the last light of the sanctuary, the light of the Christ candle, as we hear of Jesus' death on the cross. After Jesus is laid to rest, the strepidus is heard, a loud noise signifying the closing of the tomb and the shaking of the foundations of the earth. At the end of Tenebrae, the Christ candle returns, anticipating the promised resurrection. The, the devotional structure of Tenebrae may follow a variety of patterns. Sometimes the service is built around what we call the seven last words, a compilation from all four Gospels of the words Jesus spoke from the cross. Other times, a single Gospel account of the Passion story is used. Our service utilizes this latter approach, following the Passion story as it is related in the Gospel according to St. Mark. As we move through the seven episodes of the Passion narrative, candles are extinguished, symbolizing the movement closer to darkness, death, and the tomb. Of all four Gospels, Mark is the most dramatic and has the greatest sense of urgency. It is also clearly focused on the cross of Christ and the urgency of its meaning for our living. The life, death, and resurrection of God's Messiah needs to be speaking to our lives right now. The way we carry the good news that the kingdom has come near is urgently needed in the world in which we live today, inspiring us to be disciples who are responding right now at the Jesus' call to follow is perhaps the main reason Mark has written his story. As the introduction to Mark's gospel in the Lutheran Study Bible says, Jesus is indeed the hoped-for Messiah, but we only real, fully realize how he is making God's kingdom present when we experience him as the crucified Messiah. It is in the death of the Son of God, and in our own dying and rising, that we discover the true meaning of life. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light. God is light, in whom there is no darkness. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light. Come, let us worship in spirit and in truth. Amen. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence, and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, 
and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the 14th chapter of Mark. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Paschal Lamb, the disciples said to Jesus, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover supper for you? He directed two of the disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and you will come upon a man carrying a water jar. Follow him into a house he enters and say to the owner, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room? I want to eat the Passover meal there with my disciples. Then you will be shown an upstairs room, spacious, furnished, with everything in order. That is the place you are to get ready for us. Then the disciples went off. When they had reached the city, they found it just as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover supper. As it grew dark, Jesus arrived with the twelve. They reclined at table, and in the course of the meal, Jesus said, The truth is, one of you is about to betray me, one who is eating with me. They were very upset at these words, and one by one they said to him, Surely it's not me. Jesus replied, It is one of you twelve, one who dips into the dish with me. The chosen one is going the way the scriptures foretell. But woe to the one by whom the chosen one is betrayed. It were better that had that person never been born. During the meal, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. He likewise took a cup, gave thanks, and passed it to them, and they all drank from it. Jesus said to them, This is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which will be poured out on behalf of many. The truth is, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. After singing songs of praise, they walked out to the Mount of Olives.
Mark fourteen thirty two through forty two. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took them with him, Peter and James and John, and began to be distressed and agitated. He said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if he, it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were abandoned? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But... 
Let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. Shadow of the Trial They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests. The elders and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priest and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah? the Son of the Blessed One. Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. 
What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! The guards also took him over and beat him. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release the prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them again according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? They shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. They began saluting him, Hail! King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat on him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him.
Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. Reading from the book of Mark, chapter 15, verses 33 through 39. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son.
Shadow of the Tomb, Mark 15, verses 40 to 46. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joses and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Once there was a man who was out walking in the middle of the day, and along the way he fell into a hole. The hole was deep enough that he couldn't get out by himself, 
Yet he could still see the top from where he fell, and he could see if someone was passing by. The man was in the hole for a good length of time when he saw his doctor pass by. He called out, hey doc, can you help me get out of this hole? The doctor studied the man's situation for a while. Then he pulled a pad out of his pocket, wrote out a prescription, and tossed it down to the man. It was the best the doctor could do, but it did not get the man out of the hole. A short time later, the man saw his lawyer pass by. He called out, hey counselor, can you get me out of this hole? The lawyer studied the man's situation for a while, decided they had a pretty good case against whoever was responsible for making the hole, and he tossed his business card down to the man. It was the best the lawyer could do, but it did not get the man out of the hole. Good while later, the man saw his pastor pass by. He called out, hey Padre, can you get me out of this hole? His pastor studied the man's situation for a while, counseled with the man for a bit, then offered a prayer. It was the best the pastor could do, but it didn't get the man out of the hole. Finally, the man's friend came along. The man called out, my friend, can you get me out of this hole? The man's friend studied the situation for a moment. Then he jumped down in the hole with the man. The man was incredulous. Why did you do that? He cried out. Now we're both stuck down here. Don't worry, said his friend. I've been down here before and I know the way out. Jesus is the friend who jumps down in the hole with us. He jumps down in order to lead us in the way out. This is what he does on the cross. He jumps into the hole into which we have gotten ourselves. He takes on the sin of all humankind and there he does the one thing we cannot do for ourselves. The one thing nobody else can do for us. He leads us out of that hole by dying in our place. One of the first things we learn as children of the faith is that Jesus died for the forgiveness of sins. We learn this right along with Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We learn that as children, and then we spend the rest of our lives coming to an understand of a, understand of, understanding of exactly what this means. We struggle a lot in really believing what we were told. We are told we are forgiven, yet we sometimes have a hard time believing that we have been forgiven. We don't feel worthy enough to be forgiven. The truth is, of course, we're not. But we are told this doesn't stop God from forgiving. We are more important to God than the rules. This seems just too good to be true sometimes. We also resist believing forgiveness is truly the way out of the holes that we experience and have dug for ourselves in our living. When we are attacked, we feel the need to counterattack. We know that we are told to turn the other cheek. We know we are told that only love will make us strong. But we are afraid to trust this and follow in the way Jesus leads us. We rely on our laws. We rely on our wealth. We rely on our military. We will rely on the rules, and so we find ourselves stuck in a hole. Once in a monastery, there were two brothers who were fighting. One of the brothers had been insulted by the other, and he wanted to take revenge. 
He went to the abbot of the monastery and told him what had taken place, saying, I'm going to get even, father. The elder pleaded with him to let the affair in the hands of God. No, said the brother, I will not give up until I have made that fellow pay for what he has said. With that, the abbot stood up, raised his hands in the air and prayed, O oh God, thou art no longer necessary to us, and we no longer need thee to take care of us, since, as this brother says, we both can and will avenge ourselves. Well, in hearing that prayer, the younger monk bowed his head, realized the error of his ways, and gave up his idea of seeking revenge. Will we give up our ways of designing and trying to save ourselves? And will we give ourselves over to God's way, the way which God shows us in Jesus Christ? We sit in the darkness of this night, and we hear the story of Jesus' death. We think of the situations in our own lives and in the world around us, the violence that seems to worsen through the years, the hostilities that never get resolved, the poverty that never goes away, the sinfulness we cannot stop ourselves from doing. We sit in the darkness of this night, and God feels far off, and we doubt that the way of God will work. But God is not far off. God surrounds us, even this night, even in the darkness. God surrounds us. Even in his own death, Jesus is not abandoned by God. In three days, the truth of this will be shown. What God has done is jumped in the hole with us. And the question we face this night is, Will we look upon the death of Jesus and believe this is the way out? Will we, will we believe that we are forgiven and that the way of forgiveness and love is the only hope in the world around us? Will we believe in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ? Will we believe it and will we follow? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, one of us betrayed you, another denied you, and all of us have forsaken you. Yet you have died for us, taking our sins upon yourself and atoning for us before the Father. Strengthen us so that we do not turn aside, but follow you through sunlight and shadow alike. For the final victory belongs to you, Lord Jesus, and in that we hope to share. Amen. Amen. May Jesus Christ, who for our sake became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, keep you and strengthen you this night and forever. Okay. Amen.